Shall I just start sharing my screen as well? Uh, yeah, that would be ideal. So uh, uh, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. We're excited for your talk and uh, uh, the stage is very much yours. Just give me a sec. All right, can you guys all see this? Yep, looks good. And you can see my pointer as well? Yep. Okay, perfect. So good morning slash good evening, good Friday slash good Thursday, good winter, good summer, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Burgart. I'm joining you from uh, Sydney here. Um, and um, I'd like to thank you for your interest in my work. It's been quite a while since I last talked about this. Um, so I have to refresh my own memory as well as we go along. And um, I've actually um, just recycled an, an old presentation and, and all I did is I've uh, included your, your name here and the today's date and I've updated uh, one of the paper that were published then a couple of years later. Um, but otherwise it's really um, from, from then. But um, so the way I thought we can do this is um, if there is something that interests you or that you would like me to elaborate further, then I can also completely skip the slides and go to a written, handwritten presentation mode um, and explain things in further detail. And, you know, we, we, I understand that you guys come from a strong but diverse background, so I'm also trying to uh, adopt a little bit to this as we go along and and so feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, either via the chat or by just unmuting yourself and asking questions i really don't mind actually i appreciate questions um throughout the talk so the the title of this talk is uh, quantum computing in plato's cave and unfortunately that was not the title that we were allowed to put in the paper eventually um, although we tried to insist, but the editor said that this title is not scientific enough. So it, I think the, the, the eventual title was something like Expo Exponential Rise of Complexity in Quantum Computation through, I don't even remember exactly, but something boring. Um, whereas really the, the thing that, that inspired us was this connection with slightly more philosophical ideas. And um, so that's also the way I want to present this talk here although I will have some technical sides as well. This is joint work with a bunch of people, Vittorio Givonetti at the Scuola Normale in Pisa, Paolo Facchi at Bari, Saverio Pascazio at Bari, and Kazuya Yuasa and Hiromichi Nakazato at Waseda, and Christian Ahrens, who was at that time a PhD student of mine in Aberystwyth in Wales. So I moved from, from UK to Australia a couple of years ago. Anyway, not so important, but of course, I acknowledge all my uh, collaborator. Um, right, so this is an outline of this talk. I want to briefly remind you of uh, Plato's cave, although I'm not a philosopher and I, I will probably represent things in a, in, a, in a bad and wrong way. Like, you know, physicists are often quite naive when it comes to philosophy. They claim to be good philosophers, but actually they're not. So I will, I will just, you know, this is kind of high school level, what I understood of Plato's cave. And then we will talk about measurements in quantum mechanics. And so some of you will know that measurements in quantum mechanics are completely different from measurements in um, old style physics, because they can actually um, change the way things behave. And that can be good or can be bad. And then I want to introduce a measure of the complexity of a dynamics. So, you know, how complicated a dynamics can be. And then the, the main tool of this talk is, is also interesting in itself. It's, it's another philosophical thing, but in this case, it's not Plato, it's Zeno. So we all go through the ancient uh, philosophers here. So you might know the Zeno paradox uh, about the turtle and, and the runner. Um, and so there is a kind of quantum analogy of this, which is in, in itself quite interesting, I find. And um, then the, the key technical tool that I'm going to introduce is Hamiltonian purification, um, which is a, 
Okay, so so if you have a background in quantum information, maybe you have heard about state purification, but this is a different purification. Purification means making things more pure, making them more beautiful in some sense. So that relates also to Plato's caves ideas. And then we connect the, the Zeno and Plato. And, and then I guess um, the, the actual implementation, um, I, will, I will be a, a little bit more brief on, given the fact that none of you works in many body quantum mechanics. And then I'll draw my conclusions. Does it sound like a plan or you have any comments or? Yeah. Sounds awesome. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's my, my view of Plato's cave. This is a picture I took somewhere from the internet. You know, nowadays we have to actually put the sources. At five years ago, we didn't have to put the sources yet, so there's no source, but it's just some random picture from the internet. So so Plato, Plato had this idea um, of a cave with a bunch of prisoners uh, who essentially grow up in that cave. Um, so they've never been outside. And um, they are uh, watching only in one direction against the wall. And then there is a fire and um, um, some you know, actors doing some interesting stuff here, but the, um, the prisoners see the world only through the projections on the wall. So ne they never actually see this uh, lady with a, with a pottery on the top, but they only see the projections and they have to try to make sense of the world only on the basis of this very, for what seems to us very limited um information and of course the the story goes on also they i think they they take one of the prisoners outside and and they get like the first view of the sun and the three-dimensionality of the world and that's kind of like almost like a illumination event for them but um i think if i understood this correctly so in in plato's world um the the real thing was meant to be this um you know three-dimensional lady um and, and so that is not necessarily something that you might have actually um, access to, but it, in Plato's idea, it, it, it is the real truth. You know, it's the real thing that existed, whereas the thing that we actually can only see is, is this. And so I, I think he meant it as an analogy to how we see the world in our lives and how this might not be the actual world that, that existed in his world, because in his mind, the the real world is is kind of pure and beautiful and and of course the, the the world as we experience it is is often messy and and incomprehensible at at least um and 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 you can you can see even in this projected world here that that this will be very incomprehensible right you'll have shadows merging into each other and out of each other you can't really tell the bodies apart so understanding this projected world will will look uh, very uh complicated in some sense. And we will see in a quantum analogy of that, we will see that um, we will see that 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 it could be that the real quant quantum theory happens in a different world, in a more idealized world, which is somewhat easier to understand and less complex. In particular, this in this ideal world, um, let's say the um, everything will be commutative. So maybe you know that in quantum mechanics, the non-commutativity is a, is a big element. And, and in, in this idealized world that we'll come to later, things will be commutative. Although I think I should point out that also the classical world is non-commutative. So sometimes this is overly rated. So it does matter whether you first put on the socks and the shoes or vice versa, or it makes a difference whether you first boil the water and then put in the pasta or vice versa. So even the classical world, there are lots of non-commutative effects. Anyway, so the, the interesting thing about this talk is that, that this, and this is why we make this analogy with this, with this plateau, is that projections are powerful. So here we have a projection effect because we'll have some, some the real world and we have a projection against the wall through the fire. And, and then in quantum mechanics, we also have projections um, and the projections are mathematical objects, but they correspond to measurements. So in, in the quantum mechanics uh, framework, this statement would be like measurements are powerful. And I'll come back to that as well. But I, I couldn't resist putting um, this beautiful example of a projection here, which is an exhibition that ran at London at the time when I prepared this talk. 
by Noble and Webster. And, and so these are amazing artists who put together piles of garbage in a, in a very particular way that looks completely random when you actually see it and makes it almost impossible to guess um, what they're intending to do with this. But when you actually put a light source from a very particular direction and you look at the shadow, um, then you see something usually related to relationships and, and social situations. So, you, you know, it, it shows again how different the, um, the real thing and the projection can be, even in the classical world. All right, so in quantum mechanics, as I said, we also have um, projections. And, and this goes back to really the foundations of quantum mechanics to something that people call the measurement postulate. So in the classical world, um, if I check what time it is, well, that's probably a bad example because time in quantum mechanics is a hard subject. But if I measure the position of a particle or something like that, the particle doesn't care, right? It just has this well-defined position. But in, in, in quantum mechanics, it could be that the particle doesn't actually the world, the universe doesn't know the position of the particle. And only when you are asking the particle, it has to commit itself um, to a particular position. And, and then afterward, that position is actually that position. So your measurement has actually had a, a back action on the way we describe the world. And that's actually really, it's a really subtle and deep subject in quantum mechanics. So I'm not um, going to lecture you on, on that because it's, it's really complicated to to understand whether it's just the question of our mathematical description of the world that that creates this back action or whether it's an actual you know physical interaction or whether there is a a collapse of the wave function as people call it this is really complicated stuff but i mean and if if i give you a classical analogy you might you know your partner might be undecided on whether he wants to or he or she wants to go on a date with you or not um and, and, and only at the time you ask them, um, they will decide. And, and I mean, in that social situation, it's clear that the way you ask the questions and the time that you ask the question will, or could have an influence on the decision. So, so there's also this kind of back action of a collapse of a decision in some sense. All right, um, so, so in quantum mechanics, this goes down very uh, long time ago to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle who Heisenberg showed that um, not all properties of a quantum system can be simultaneously uh, defined. So for example, the position and the momentum of a particle cannot be simultaneously defined at high precision. And in some sense, that's at the time was considered as a, as a shock and as a bad thing, right? I mean, at the time people believed that the universe worked like a, like a precise clockwork and a clockwork can only work precisely if you knew all the, um, configurations of all the particles in the universe and the, the fact that that these configurations cannot be precisely defined was considered as a bad thing but of course we are now you know like a almost a century later to this and so we realize nowadays that that this can also be a good thing right so quantum computing is again something you can ask me you know how does quantum computing work and i can i can try to talk you a little bit through this on the whiteboard if you like but um Quantum computing is, is a way of doing quantum computing that um, is supposedly more efficient <clears throat> on certain tasks than classical computing, and there's a big hype around it at the moment. And, and then the, the standard way of quantum computing is pretty similar to how you know classical computing. So you, you have a bunch of bits, you just don't call them bits, you call them qubits because you get more funding if you do that. And then you um, apply a bunch of gates on those bits, which are logical gates, just like in classical machines, right? So that's the boring way of doing uh, quantum computing. But, but what Rausendorf showed um, many moons ago is that if you had a, a suitable initial configurations of all your bits, um, then you could actually do quantum computing just by looking at them in a skillful way. You could do, you know, look at qubit number one and see whether it's zero or one. And then depending on that outcome, you look at qubit number 15 and you see if that's zero or one and you keep on doing that. And that's actually your algorithm. All you do is look. So, I mean, that's actually conceptually also super cool, right? I mean, the fact that you can do computation just by looking at things. 
and and the result that I'm going to present today is is along a similar spirit. So what actually motivated our study was to understand how measurements generically change the system. So this protocol here by Rausendorf is a very specific protocol, but we wanted to have a slightly broader way of understanding how measurements change a system. I'm gonna pause here for a second in case you guys have any comments or questions. So in order to understand this, we, we needed to understand a little bit um, better the what, what I call here the dynamical complexity of a quantum system, because I want to make the case to you that um, measurements change the complexity of a system. So I need to introduce a measure of how we, how much, uh, how do we quantify this? And in general, this is um, not a hard, uh, not an easy task. And there are many different approaches. Actually, since you're computer sciences, you, you probably know about Kolmogorov complexity, which is a beautiful concept. I'm not going to talk about it, unfortunately, but there's also a quantum version of it. It's a super active field. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm a control physicist, right? I'm more coming from the engineer direction here. Um, so, you know, the task of an engineer is to um, usually look at the differential equation and to change the structure of the differential equation to, to act uh, to, in a way that the differential equation does something good or something interesting. Like a standard example would be like a steam engine and you have a differential equation that describes how how the temperature in the kettle goes in the steam engine and then you might add some kind of knob that controls the temperature so that the whole thing doesn't explode so that's kind of the classical field of engineering and and there is a similar field of quantum engineering which is my area so in my case the knobs are like laser fields or magnetic fields or some parameters that experimentators in quantum physics can actually change. And the goal is not to prevent something from exploding, but it's it's to, to create quantum computing, for example. That's my, my personal research area. So the, the game, I'm, I'm simplifying a lot here, but the, the game goes something like this. You have two Hamiltonians. So the Hamiltonian is an energy function that describes mathematically uh, how we apply forces to a field, uh, to a quantum system. So you might have a magnetic field, and then this will correspond to this G of T. And when the magnetic field is on, G is one. And when the magnetic field is off, G is zero. And this H here describes some object that um, in the differential equation, which happens to be the Schrodinger equation that tells us whether the field is on or off. So consider this case here where we have two different fields that we can switch on and off. Maybe it's a magnetic and an electrical one, or maybe two different magnetic ones. And so in this context, the F of T and the G of T are the controls there in the hand of the experimentator. And the way we quantify this, and this is something you'll just have to believe me, is mathematically, these things are matrices in quantum computing. And what we do is we, we first de de decorate them with complex i, so we multiply them with complex i. And then you, when you have matrices, you can build linear combinations. So you can think of them as a vector space. So we built this vector space spanned by h1 and h2. But then we also consider commutators of elements in the, in the vector space. So maybe I, I just um, briefly show this on the board um, for those of you who haven't seen this. Where's my board gone? I think my board has disappeared, so I'm gonna try to recreate it. All right, sorry guys, technical problem. Yeah, no problem. No Just worries, and maybe as you're working on that, I can ask a question that you can feel yes, free please, to go ahead. answer or defer until later a bit. But I guess the idea of being in Plato's cave and we have this limited window to observe um, and the prisoners might observe by opening and closing their eyes. And that's like taking a measurement or something. I think that's a really interesting way to frame it. And I really like that. I guess, is there an intuition at this current moment? Is this sort of like these controls with the Lie algebras are ways that the prisoners inside the cave can like tilt their head or observe in different angles or, or how, what's the connection so far? And if that's coming, um, yeah, totally it, is, it is coming, but I can already comment on it. Um, 
if, if you give me one second, um, I get my board up. I think I got it now. I just have to bring it to the right place. All right, so hopefully, can you see this? Um, so, so what I mean with this Lie algebra is this, this H1 and H2 are just matrices. And so when you have matrices, you can multiply them. So you can, for example, consider the, the product of H1 and H2, and you know the matrix products. Usually we don't even write the dot, but that's what we mean when we write them next to each other. And um, of course, you can also take the product the other way around. And it turns out with matrices, the, the order matters. And then if we do something like this, we take one way around the product and another way around, we call this the commutator of H1 and H2. This is called the commutator. And this is a, a, going to be a central object today. So in this, in this Lie algebra that I'm talking about here, we're not just taking linear combinations of these matrices, which I assume you know, so the vector space picture, but we actually also take commutators. And then when we take commutators, we get new matrices. And we take again linear combinations, we take new commutators, new matrices, new linear combinations. We keep on doing that until we get nothing new. And then this thing, this object, which is mathematicians call a Lie algebra, um, is the central mathematical object for today's talk. That's all you need to know about it. I can't explain to you how this comes across. You might get a hint of it later, but but th this is an object. Now, in terms of your question, sorry, I didn't catch your name when you asked it, but um, in terms of the question, sorry? Sorry about that, I'm Jacob. Jacob. Okay, Jacob, sorry, yes. Um, in terms of the question, yeah, so so the, this dynamics is going to be the, the ideal dynamics that takes place in the real world. And we're going to introduce projections or measurements in a second, and we will see that the projections will modify this dynamics in a way that makes it more complex and more messy. So that's the analogy of the story. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for the question. And I'm okay, sorry, so, I, I missed one. Yes. In your definition of a commutator, was it that you create an equivalence relation that forces commutivity to be true, or was it literally H1, H2 minus H2, H1? Like, is this a minus? It's or literally is it... that. Okay. So okay. Let's, let's do a simple example because this will also pop up later, so I might as well do it now. So if you, if you take um, C2 as our vector space, um, then, then the matrices on the vector space are two by two matrices, complex two by two matrices, right? And so one matrix that is quite popular is often written as X. This is known as a Pauli matrix. And actually, if you think about it from a quantum computing perspective, this is an, what you could also call a not gate. Because in quantum computing, we, we, sorry, this notation might also not be, might be strange for someone, you know, like, why would I uh, open, open um, an object, especially for computer scientists, if you, if you, if you have a, a program that, that checks whether all brackets that you open are actually closed, this is kind of strange. This is called a, a cat. This is how we, so it's half of a bracket. Um, so we describe states in quantum mechanics. So, but they are like the logical states. So this corresponds to a, a classical bit being zero and you might encode this as a vector like this. And this is just a definition and you encode another vector like that. And then if you act with X on say the vector zero, it's not difficult to see that when you multiply this matrix here with this matrix, you get the one vector. So this is why and likewise, if you act on one, you get the zero vector. So this is why it's called a not gate. And then another gate that is important, which is not one that has a classical analogy is, is the Z gate. And that's this gate here. So it, it's interesting to note, you know, with a single bit, with a single classical bit, there is not much interesting you can do, right? You can do the identity, which means leave it as it is. You can do a, a not gate, which means flip it. You can reset it to zero, you know, initialize it. It's another gate, or you can reset it to one. And of course, classically, you can also copy it. So, you know, the fan out operation is another one in computer science that is important. But this is basically it. In the quantum case, we cannot copy. That's interesting in itself. And um, 
but there are infinitely other gates we can do just with a single gate. And so, I mean, and this is not the subject of the talk, but for example, you can do the square root of not. You can do a gate on a qubit such that when you apply it twice, you get the not gate. And this is completely impossible in, 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 in classical computing. And you could actually argue that this is the source of all the good things in quantum computing. In fact, if you only had a classical computer and you added only the single extra gate, this would be already universal for quantum computing. So this is a good way of understanding from a co classical computing perspective, what is the power, the logical power of, of quantum computing. Sorry, I'm, I'm diverting. No, but, Daniel, this is um, great. Can I, can I make one comment here? Because yes, as, a, please. as someone who was a computer scientist and then learning some of this, it was really confusing for me at first. So I think uh, the bracket notation is interesting because we could imagine encoding regular bits in this way. It wouldn't really get us anything. It would be a bit more complicated. But the thing that helped me understand this the most is that you can imagine our bits are just vectors. Maybe one is up and down. And for quantum computing, you can just have one in the middle and the measurement says, oh, now it's up or now it's down. And that would, from your analogies earlier, this would be sort of the decision. Like before we asked Daniel to come to this talk, his decision about um, joining and talking to computation club is not even a determined thing. So maybe a poor example, but it could be in the middle. And as soon as you ask to make a measurement, then it becomes something we observe in the real world. So I don't know if that's yes. undermining, but that helped me understand it when I first learned. Actually, it's it's a it's a it's a great uh, suggestion, and it's it's the way things are usually taught, and it's a way that I try to usually completely avoid. And and the, <laughs> the reason is that, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. So the reason is um, that you 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 say okay for this, for example, I can also apply. I can also have this state here, right? I can have zero plus one. But the, the reason is that we never explain to people what that actually means. Like it's it's really complicated to understand what is the, the meaning of this. And then there is this semi-classical trying to understand it by saying it's in between. And then people start confusing it with, for example, fuzzy logic, right? You can also classically, you can have bits which are in between by just having a probability distribution that you sample from. And you say it's 50% this, 50% that. But th there's nothing that could be more different from this state than, than this 50-50 situation. And, and then some people say this is simultaneously in one and the other state. But what, that, what does that mean? That's like a completely meaningless sentence. And, and some people say, you know, like David Deutsch would say, in one parallel universe, it's zero. And in one parallel universe, it's one. And when you measure you decide in which of the two parallel universes your consciousness ends up with. I think all these things are just making things unnecessarily more complicated. And the, the truth is we don't really understand, even as physicists, what this means. But, but what we all can agree on is that this is a possible gate. And if you just do a little bit of algebra, you, you just say, OK, I apply this square root of naught on you know, I apply the square root of naught um, on on the state zero. What 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 could the state be? What well, it has to be something, right? If you say, well, if it's if it's zero, if you say it's if you postulate it's zero, well, then you've mapped zero to zero. So if you do that twice, you still get zero. So you don't get the naught. You, it doesn't square. So I should have said what I mean with this is that if we apply it twice, this is the definition of the square root. We get the not gate. Right, that, that's the, the, the way we think about the square root of naught. So it cannot be the zero maps to zero. It can also not be that zero maps to one because that would already be the not gate. And, and if you apply that twice, we could go back to zero. So, so just from the fact that there is this gate, you can say there are new states. And the, of course, these are exactly the states that Jacob talked about. But the beauty of this is I don't even need to write them down and I don't need to try to explain what they um, ontologically mean what is the you know the the idealistic meaning of this um we, because i don't need to and and so that that's why i like this explanation at least for outreach talks and public talks or talks to people who are not familiar yet with quantum mechanics i like that much better but i mean of course once you want to go a little bit beyond this uh, you probably um need to introduce those states although there is a book 
if you're interested, there's a book by Terry Rudolph. Um, it's called Cures for Quantum. That gets quite far by basically just talking about uh, such a simple gate and, and, and he can explain essentially quantum computing without ever going into vector spaces, which is quite nice, you know. That's awesome. I apologize for the aside, Daniel. Thank you for clarifying my thinking. And it's really interesting that um, my potential misrepresentation to make it easier to understand reinforces the idea that thinking about this from a Plato's cave idea is, is sort of important, right? Like, so, so that's awesome. There's nothing you've misinterpreted. It's, it's perfectly right what you've said. It's just that from a pedagogic point of view, it's, it's somehow doesn't kind of grasp the important things. Um, that's why I try to avoid it. Awesome. Sorry all, for all right. going um, in a different so, direction. So anyway, what I was going to say is that, um, and that comes back to, um, I think Max's question, right? About the commutator. Um, so we now have this, this matrix X and we have this matrix Z. And so it will turn out that, that X and Z do not, do not commute. Uh, sorry, this is not what I want to write. So X and Z do not commute. So if I compute this, I get, um, usually people would write this as two times complex I times Y, which is another matrix Y defined by I minus I, which is somewhat confusing um, because the I of course goes away and just becomes a minus I. So, I mean, of course you multiply two real matrices in one way and the other, you have to get a real matrix. It's just that physicists like to, to um, factor out a complex I here for, for reasons that are related to, to spin. Um, but again, it's a, not something I want to talk about. So they, yeah, they do not commute in general, these matrices, and this is an important property. So we're not kind of factoring it out or, or, or dividing it out or anything. We are actually appreciating the, the beauty of this. All right, let me try to get a little bit back on track of, of the talk. Otherwise, I mean, how much time do you want to spend, by the way? I mean, I'm also happy not to deliver the key message and just stop at some point um, or, you know, go on. And I'd say that the hour is yours in whatever format you prefer, Daniel. So if, if you want to do a short talk and then have Q&A afterward, that's fine. If you'd like to kind of go like this or people ask questions throughout, that's fine too. So whatever you prefer. Okay. We're having a great time no matter what. Let's let's see. So so um, so we we just said that we have these Hamiltonians, we have these matrices. We built this complex object called the Lie algebra, and then the the dimension of the Lie algebra is a measure of the complexity. So the bigger the Lie algebra, this is a vector space. So the, the the higher the dimension of this vector space, the bigger the complexity, and you can basically tell if the complexity is maximal that you have a universal quantum computer. So this is kind of the analogy of um universal gates on a classical machine you know like the not gate uh, the the um how is it called the, the nor gate nor is is universal for classical computing and if you wanted to show that that a set of matrices is universal for a, a set of hamiltonians is universal for quantum computing you would have to compute this dimensionality and it will basically tell you that this is the case now, what we um, wanted to understand is what happens if we can also measure, right? This is what I, the, this is the ideals, right? Um, and now we, we want to see what happens on the shadow side of the cave when we project. And so I mentioned earlier that we, the way we describe uh, mathematically uh, measurements in quantum mechanics is indeed through something called projections. So projections are just matrices that square to themselves. The idea is that if you, project on the wall and you you project the projection, then you still get the same thing, right? So projections always have this property that when you project twice, you get the same object. Um, and also in quantum mechanics, only that now they are described by matrices. And so now I can talk about this other cool uh, philosophical conundrum in quantum mechanics, um, which is called the quantum Zeno effect. But the 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 way I describe it here is a bit more mathematical than it's usually described. So you have to uh, have a little bit of patience, but I'll try to give you a, a more intuitive explanation in a second. This is the way you define the exponential function in high school. Do you remember when you, when you do high school, you talk about 
usually some growth project or a growth process or maybe uh, accumulated interest in a bank where you get an interest payment um, a proportional interest payment paid out at an at a rate uh, n and uh, maybe every month and then you look at what happens if if this interest payment comes in more regular intervals maybe every day maybe every second and you perform the limit and you will find that this goes to the exponential now this works for numbers in high school but it also works for matrices in fact this is the one way of defining the exponential of a matrix in uh, university level mathematics and and the interesting thing here is that this is also how we think of uh, evolution in quantum mechanics so you know this goes deeper again but i told you that that we have a differential equation with these guys h and solutions of differential equations are often written in terms of exponential functions so e to the h with some decoration is essentially the time evolution of a quantum system and so that's why these things are important also for this talk um, there is a slight modification that you can have instead of talking about just a fixed X, a fixed matrix, you can think of a sequence of matrix, matrices, Xn. So you could think of the, the bank changing the interest rate as you in change the interval in such a way that as you go take the continuum limit, uh, it converges. And, and so this works um, and you can easily prove it. And so what I want to look at is the evolution of a quantum system, which we described by this exponential function of a matrix, interspersed with measurements. So this, the intuition is that you have a quantum system, it evolves, it does what it likes to do. Maybe it rotates. Quantum systems tend to like to rotate. That's another important message of this talk. They rotate like a, 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 a maybe, well, okay, you're not, necessarily from physics background, but this is kind of a standard physics picture that you have a, a, a spin, a, a magnetic, uh, like a compass needle in a magnetic field might uh, start oscillating. So this is a kind of oscillation, but now in, at, at regular intervals, at regular time intervals, T over N, what we do is we, we ask the spin, hey, actually in which direction are you pointing at the moment? And then every time we, we ask, we have this back action, right? Think about it this way, if you, if you ask your partner if they want to go on a date with you and you ask them every millisecond and they have just said no, um, the probability that you are going to change their mind by asking them like this is, uh, is, is, is low. And this is essentially the quantum zeno effect. So if we have a, a particle that rotates and we ask it constantly, are you still pointing in this direction? If we do it fast enough, the particle will completely freeze and, and just stay where it is, stay put. And, and so this is the quantum Zeno effect in an intuitive way, but we are looking at a slightly more general case here. And okay, so this is maybe a technical bit that I will skip, but it's easy to show using this theorem above. And, and if you want to follow it, take a screenshot of this and, and follow it in your own time, but it's just an exponent, uh, it's just an, a Taylor expansion of the exponential and a re-exponentiation at the end that shows that um, when, you, when you look at this in the limit, the evolution is described by a modified um, matrix. So you initially your, 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 your thing was rotating under an, a Hamiltonian under a matrix H, and now it's rotating under the Hamil under, under a modified Hamiltonian that is written by the sandwich of H between this projection. So this is a matrix product of P times H times P. It's, it's not a, 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 an internet programming language. And, um, and so this formula PHP is really central to this talk. And, and I apologize if, if I didn't explain this carefully, but the, the takeaway message is if you frequently measure, measure a, a system, you can describe the, the dynamics under the measured system by a modification of the um, Hamiltonian, the object that describes the evolution of the system in the first place. Okay, so now I want to bring together this, or maybe I pause a second to give you an opportunity for questions again. Um, but I want to bring together these two things. So I want to bring together this modification that we get through the measurement and this, um, this idea of measuring the complexity of a measurement by the Lie algebra. 
And so the question I'm, I would like to ask is, um, is the projected dynamic simpler? Yeah, so, so um, you, can, you can see that, I didn't explain this when I came here, but the evolution here takes place on a smaller space. And that space is the space you're projecting into. Think of it as the two-dimensional wall of the prisoners. Um, so, so you have the real dynamics on the real three-dimensional space and you're projecting it onto a two-dimensional space. And you're asking whether that dynamics on the two-dimensional space is simpler. This is the question I ask here. And, and so the answer is, it depends on, on, on the rank of this projection. This is a matrix, matrices have ranks. It's a measure of their invertibility or their non-invertibility. And, and so if this matrix is a rank one projection, which we in quantum mechanics, we write in this mysterious way that looks like some Japanese cartoon character. Um, so if the rank is, is one, then it turns out that the dynamics is trivial. So you're, you're forcing the system too much. And this is the, the standard way the Zeno effect is explained. So I could, um, you know, send a, no, okay. Uh, I was going to make the analogy with the quantum Zeno bomb, uh, a bomb that just measures uh, a whole population, whether they're going to war or not so strongly that they're never ever going to war. But I think in the current uh, political climate, that is not an apt uh, comment. So I didn't say anything. Please cut it out from the recording. Um, but but you know, if you if you do a rank one measurement on something, then they cannot move at all anymore. This is the idea of the Zeno effect. And this this is the analogy with the turtle, which where it seems like like Achilles can never outrun the turtle if you look. Well, in this case, you just consider the dynamics at particular intervals. There's a nicer mathematical uh, analogy there, but I don't have time to talk about. But it's called Zeno's paradox. But if, for example, you have a rank two projection, which means, for example, you have two particles and you're only looking at one of them, then it turns out that the dynamics can be more complex as well. And this is the key point of this paper. Um, so, so for example, if you have a two, two bits, which we describe by another symbol here, it's called the tensor product. Um, and if you have two systems and you only xenophy, you only measure one of them very frequently, you're of course only freezing the one that you measure. The one that you don't doesn't matter, right? So if you, you know, if you uh, forbiddingly have two partners and you, you ask only one of them to go on a date with you, of course the other one is not going to uh, um, make up their mind or it's not going to be frozen, right? I'm saying something rather trivial here. But the interesting thing is you might have a connection between uh, these qubits, a coupling between these qubits. In fact, quantum computing relies heavily on being able to make your qubits interact. Um, even classical computing relies on that, right? You, if you want to do a logical gate, the state of one bit should depend on the other bit. So you need to make them talk to each other. You need to connect them. So in quantum mechanics, this connection happened through, um, again, through matrices. And so in this case, it's the tensor product of the the not gate and the not gate that I want to consider. So this is flips one qubit and flips the other qubit. And this one hasn't got a classical analogy. So it's just the Z gate that I introduced earlier on the board. And it applies the Z gate on one of them and the Z gate on the other. In fact, the Z gate is just the same as a not gate, but in a different direction. Um, that's a mystical statement, but you can, you can think of the qubit as being um, pointing towards something on the sphere. It's, it's like a round version of the bit. Classical bit can only up and down. Qubit can point anywhere on the sphere. And then the not gate flips up to down, like uh, Jacob mentioned this earlier. Or uh, the Z gate flips uh, this direction with that direction. So uh, flips X, uh, the X direction to minus X. So um, in this case, again, this is probably slightly mysterious to you if you haven't seen this before in quantum computing. But it turns out that the complexity of this, these two things is very low because they commute. It doesn't matter whether you first apply two not gates this direction and then two not gates that direction or whether you do it the other way around. This is just something you can compute. Geometrically, what this means is if I go in this direction and in that direction or in this direction first and in that direction, I, I do the same thing. I end up in the same point. 
maybe this geometric thing is, is, a, is a nice way of thinking about these commutators. But now if we, if we project the qubit on the first qubit in a particular dire diagonal um, direction on the sphere, um, what happens is this guy gets kind of frozen in the, like in the Zeno style that we mentioned before, but the second guy can still move, right? And it will move under X. And likewise, this will get frozen, this, this guy here, but the second guy can move under Z. And those two Hamiltonians no longer commute. We, as, as I showed to you earlier, X and Z do not commute. And so, so when you compute this, you get non-commutation and you get a three-dimensional Lie algebra. So the, even though you're talking about a smaller space now, you have less space because you're projecting, the dynamics becomes more complex. So geometrically what happens is that now you go in the X direction and Z direction, or you go in the Z direction and the X direction, you don't end up in the same place. And the difference of these two places is measured by the commutator that I introduced on the board. So, so already for this simple example, you can see that the, that the complexity can actually grow. In this case, it doesn't grow very big. It doesn't grow by very much because it goes from two to three. So, so the key point then at this point, when we realize we can bring Zeno and, and, and um, Plato together and show on the simple two qubit example with four dimensional matrices, we can show that the world gets more complex, even though we're projecting it. We asked ourselves the question whether that is true in general. And it turned out to be yes. So um, let me, um, yeah, so actually I, I, can, I don't have to skip this because this is kind of the, the, the key slide of, of this talk in some sense, because this is the construction that allowed us to show that it is completely general, which means that it's kind of cool if you, if you have a, a, a um, many, many qubits, and it turns out that their dynamics is, is, is trivial in the sense that the Lie algebra is two-dimensional. So, you know, no matter how you engineer your magnetic fields on the system, you can hit it as hard as you want, but you only get a really low complexity dynamics. It turns out that in general, if you start looking at one qubit, if you're projecting away one qubit, or if you're, if you're observing this one qubit, the remaining qubits can become universal for quantum computing. So the, the, it's really a drastic, it's an exponential increase of the complexity. Okay, so, so this is probably quite a lot to take on if, you, if, you, if I already lost you earlier, but let me Sorry, just- Sorry, Daniel, um, uh, would, you, would you mind just saying that one more time? Like not even changing anything, just, just one more time, that last statement. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I, will, I will have the more precise statement of, the, of, the, of this theorem in, in, in one slide or something like that. So maybe I'll just come back to that. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so the pure, Sorry, was there some, some other point or? No, okay. So the purification is, is kind of, you know, the projection is the thing that, that makes um, the, the three-dimensional objects two-dimensional. The purification is the other way around. So we now look at the shadows on the wall and we want to, we see that their, their dynamics is complicated and we want to kind of purify them into something that is simple, into the ideals. And it turns out that you can do this and it's very simple. So if you take two matrices on a D, D by D space and you add just one qubit to the space and in, in quantum physics, we describe this with the tensor product. So this is my, my additional qubit here. And you, you define a mother and father Hamiltonian, H, capital H1 and capital H2, like so then it turns out that no matter what, what H1 and H2 were, the big idealized Hamiltonians always commute. This is a very simple calculation, but again, I will skip this in the interest of time. But you can, it, it, in some sense, this introduces some symmetry which makes things commute. You, you see that here, I, I, I put the diagonal matrix here and the off diagonal matrix here. And here I did it the other way around. So this gives some anti-symmetry to be precise. And this anti-symmetry means that there is some cancellation. 
But then if I project back, I get essentially the original Hamiltonians. So, you know, I, I, I take my, my shadows on the wall, I abstract them into some mathematical object on a larger space. And if I then project it back, I get back the, the Hamiltonians, that's the intuition. And so that's, that's it essentially, because um, it's well known since the fifties that there are pairs of matrices which have maximal complexity. You know, there, is, there are quantum computers where you can drive the whole dynamics with just a single or, you know, two switches. You just shake two things, you just apply two magnetic fields and the whole thing will be universal. And so all we need to do is to take that, such an example and to purify it, and we will get simple dynamics on the on the purified space and complex dynamics on the projected space. So I just apply this this lemma, and I get that um, this is Jacob. This is what the more precise statement. So frequent measurements on a single qubit almost always turn a commutative system, so one that has a small Lie algebra two-dimensional system into a quantum computer. I'm over hyping this a little bit because of course, in the presence of noise, this is not gonna be a quantum computer. So, you know, one has to be a little bit careful what, what one says here, but this is the simplified statement. And conversely, and that's the more important thing, any complex dynamics can also be purified in such a way. So you could say that um, the whole complexity of quantum mechanics on the dynamical level, the whole thing that that we get non-commutative dynamics arises from the fact that we actually live in a Plato cave, and there is some, you know, some big measurement going on all the time that projects us into this cave. And maybe if we could jailbreak this cave, we would see a simpler version of quantum theory in which things would be commutative. That's but the, the, the punchline of the talk. Purification is non-unique, right? So there could be any number of realities that we're watching the projection of. Yes, the purification is highly non-unique. Yeah. Let me just say one more thing, and then this will be the last slide actually in the interest of time. Um, I have some examples later, but I think they're not so important. Um, let me just say that, that I, I say something here like almost always, right? And this is something I've, I've brushed over. And the, the reasoning is, is also slightly mysterious, which is that the determinant is a polynomial. And of course, you know the determinant is a polynomial, right? The determinant in linear algebra of a matrix, you just multiply certain elements and, and anti-symmetrize. But what is the meaning of this? Um, it turns out in control theory, and that's my, my home subject, right? In control theory, if something is true for a particular matrix, then it is also true for almost all matrices. To give you an analogy, for example, almost all matrices are invertible. If you, you know, just randomly use um, Python to create a, a matrix with uh, elements randomly chosen over some measure, um, that matrix will almost always turn out to be invertible. And, and why is that? Well, um, because the determinant of this matrix is a polynomial so the only way to get the determinant zero is to hit the zeros of this polynomial. But polynomials don't have so many zeros. Like a, a, a single polynomial only has finitely many zeros and a multinomial has, has, has zeros which have measure zeros. So they're still very rare. And so the same reasoning in a more abstract fashion can be applied in control theory to show that if something is controllable for a particular case, then it is also controllable for almost all modifications or for almost all matrices with a similar structure. And so this means it's not really important that I measure one qubit and it becomes universal. I could measure two qubits or I could measure some in a, in a complicated way, some entangled um, basis on the system. It doesn't matter. Um, almost all systems um, will become universal. I realized I skimmed over a, a question on, on, on the chat, but you can ask that in the, in the, in the second. So anyway, so that's my conclusion. So, so the messiness of quantum mechanics might be simplified um, if we go into, into out of Plato's cave, if we break out of Plato's cave and we look at a new mathematics on a high dimension space. This is a bit overhyped. I mean, I don't think this will actually lead to a new quantum theory, but um, 
anyway, that's the story. And, and I, I, I'll stick to the story at the moment. But I mean, you can see it's five years from now. We don't have from that talk. We don't have a new quantum theory. It, didn't, it definitely didn't deliver on that promise, but I still think it's a, it's a kind of cute example. So with that, I, I want to conclude and I thank you for your attention and your nice questions. Daniel, thank you so much. This is terrific. Uh, I, I certainly have questions. I'm sure Jacob does too, but we have a bunch of people on the call. So uh, if other people have questions, can you please unmute yourselves and go for it? And we'll do our best to not talk over each other. I think Daniel had a question about the probability distribution over zero and one in the chat. I suppose that's about uh, the difference between um, fuzzy qubits and and quantum qubits in some sense, right? So the the let, let me just say something there, even if it might not been, have been the question, but it's a it's an important point. So you cannot model quantum physics by just probability distributions. Turns out you can model quantum physics by probability distributions if you allow the probabilities to be occasionally negative, but. Uh, but otherwise you cannot. There are some effects, interference, where probabilities can somewhat cancel each other. And you know that positive numbers cannot cancel each other. So you need negative numbers, at least. Usually we use complex numbers. Maybe I, I shall I just go, go on? Jacob, you have a question? Uh, Jacob seems to be having trouble unmuting himself, but I can ask one while he figures that out. Um, okay, so you have a, a control theory background, right? Uh, you sort of implied that. Um, I, I started to think you might have a control theory background when you used the word controls earlier on. Uh, and, and I wonder, um, in control theory, they talk about the Zeno paradox in the context of hybrid systems, right? Because hybrid systems, like, for example, hybrid automata would be the only systems that I guess mathematically can be non-Zeno, if I remember correctly. So um, I, I don't know. I was just, I was just wondering, like, uh, was it your control theory background that made you think about the Zeno thing in the first place and, and kind of characterize the problem that way, uh, or is this like a well understood um, characterization? Okay, so um, like anything in in life, it's it's related to the people you meet. And um, so I, I had the luck to meet Paolo Facqui and Saverio Pascazio from Bari, who are kind of the world experts on Zeno. And uh, in, we had a, a good chat and, and we realized that um, in, in quantum control theory, modeling measurements is a kind of a headache. Usually quantum control theory is done with differential equations where things move continuously, but measurements are somewhat abrupt. And, and I, it's always bugged me that, that although we know that measurements are important in quantum theory and they can induce universalities such as in measurement-based quantum computing, um, I was not able to mathematical model, mathematically understand and model this as a control theorist. But here there's two nice people from Bari telling me that, that you can model measurements as continuous um, objects in some sense, if you apply them very frequently, if you go to this limit, then the only effect of the measurement is in some sense to modify the Hamiltonian. And I knew Hamiltonians, right? So, so I just had to bring two things together that I knew. Um, so this was the reason. The, the, of course, the more interesting question is what happens away from the Zeno effect, but that's, that's a really half, hard question. I, I don't exactly understood your comment on hybrid system, but let me say that the Zeno effect also has applications in control theory other than this, because it turns out you can use it to protect one quantum system against noise created by another system, for example. And you know, noise is a big challenge in quantum computing. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if it's true or not, but the, the Wikipedia page for hybrid systems claims that they're the only systems that can exhibit non-Zeno behavior. Um, but I, that might not be actually a fact. It might just be something some grad student wrote. So I don't it know. Would be, it would be nice if you could put the link for that in the chat because I'd like to read up on it later. Yeah, no I problem. know that um, technically, I mean, this is all with matrices. With matrices, the, the world is nice and simple. But um, in quantum physics, there are also um, operators which are much harder to, to deal with. And in continuous systems, you can have systems where the Zeno effect does not work because they are infinite dimensional and, and there might be something bad going on.
which is also interesting, but yeah. Jacob. Awesome. Uh, okay, let me lower my hand. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Daniel. Um, this is I've one of our best talks, I think. It's been very compelling for me and a lot of thank my you. different quantum uh, classes and people I've talked to have been inherently um, unsatisfying in some ways, even if very interesting, because I really like building intuition. And the allegory of Plato's cave, I think, is fantastic here. I guess I have one question that would be a good ending one. I'll do a quick question now and also a comment that this makes me think of um, about a lot of things ending up being universal. This is something that happens quite a bit in sort of um, computer hacking land where often what happens is there's some type of little tiny bug or issue. And it turns out that you often don't need very much to be universal at all. Like for example, a lot of times a single assembly instruction is completely universal. Like you could compile all your C programs to the move instruction. Um, so it was really exciting for me to sort of see this parallel with quantum and classical in the way you described, and I haven't seen that before. And my quick question is about state purification because I just to make sure I properly understand that I think you have a picture earlier on of a projection of all this garbage that becomes a silhouette of two different people. Yes. Uh, I guess, yeah, when we go back to that, I'll ask my question. Yeah. A nice picture to so, end the talk with anyway. <laughs> nice. So my, I guess my question here is, is this one example of like state purification and that you could have easily imagined just two people sitting there instead of the trash? Is this state purification or am I missing it? Or is it it's a different concept entirely? Like, yeah, so, so state purification is almost exactly the inverse of this picture. Um, so you would have trash on the projection level and the purification would be um, two people sitting there. Um, so state purification is, is the understanding. It's, it's a very deep um, and beautiful statement. And, and it's very simple as well. So, um, you know, we, we see randomness in the real world, right? You throw a die and, and you'll see something that at least reasonably well can be modeled with, uh, with a random outcome. Or you, you create a random number generator on, on your computer, a pseudo random number generator. But of course, this kind of randomness is, is cheating, right? So the randomness only occurs because you don't know exactly the velocity of your hand when you threw up the die, or you don't, you don't um, know the seat uh, of, of, your, of your pseudo random number generator. But if you knew it, you could actually compute this. Um, and in quantum mechanics, it turns out that essentially all probabilities are somewhat like that. So every time you see randomness, you can explain it by um, something that is non-random, but lives on a bigger space, is related to, to, um, to some knowledge that you have about a bigger system. And this knowledge will be typically encoded by entanglement. So, so what will happen is that the, the random system is entangled with a bigger space such that the, the big picture is not entang uh, is, 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 people call this pure. It means you know everything about the state. But if I neglect a part of the system, if I don't look at that part, then it looks like random. And so it's, it's kind of the opposite of this because it looks more random on the projection than on the original system. Awesome, thank you. Now I have two other quick questions, but I'll leave it for someone else to ask for now. Yeah, actually, we should probably wrap up because we've taken more than an hour of your time, Daniel. But um, thank you for so joining. Why, why don't we wrap up officially now, and and then um, I sure. can stay stay on for a few more minutes if there are further questions, and that also gives me the time to to copy out your comment on the chat. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. Uh, so I'm going to stop the recording.